I did not have a specific Mother's Day message today, but I can recount, especially this week, I've had, um, oh, examples where she's given up her own drink, she's uh, allowed samples of her food, she has sat in the back so one who was not feeling well could lay on her lap, uh, she's pushed uh, me around Frontier City in a wheelchair, Man, what a great week for mothers, right? <laughs> She's had meetings and everything, but isn't that just the week of a mother? Always busy, always going, always sacrificing, always giving. And there is not a, I, I mean, even I, cover to cover, right? Stories, accounts, it's just still not going to do it justice. Our mothers, if we have a good relationship with our mothers, it's golden. If we don't, I would encourage you to try to strengthen that bond. Try to recreate that bond. And if, if you're with us today, and you no longer have your mother on this side of heaven, then I also am with you today because of the blessings that God gave you while she was here. I know um, my grandmother's uh, one is in heaven, and she's enjoying heaven today, this Mother's Day. The other one is going to go out to dinner with us this evening, right? But I know that both of them would have been happy to know not that Jeremiah was feeling healthy today, but that Jeremiah was preaching today. That Jeremiah was in the Word. It wasn't just Jeremiah that we are in the in the place of the Lord. We're in the house of the Lord, and we are in the Word today. I want to start off with a verse. It's not going to be up here. I did not give this to Tim. It hit me this morning, so this is not Tim's fault. This was my fault. But it's Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 3. I'll read it. You can stand if you'd like. I'm going to read it in two different versions. First, the uh, ESV, and second, the King James Version. It says, Call to me, and I will answer you, and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. And the King James Version says, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and shew thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. You may be seated. God desires us, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, the Trinity desires us to call upon Him, to call out to Him. Why? Because he says he will answer us, and he will show us great and mighty things which we do not know. There's a lot of times, like I just said, I'm not going to, throughout the whole service here, I'm not going to try to connect it back to mothers, right? But in the same way that we don't know what goes through the mind of our, our, our mothers or our wives or our friends or even sometimes ourselves, God does. God does. And he wants us to call upon him. And He wants to show us these great and mighty things. The title of the lesson today uh, is Living for Christ, What Now? And the key verses are going to be in Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 14. For some, uh, you will say, man, this is a very easy uh, sermon. I could have taught that. You probably could have. But as we go back and we're researching and looking... You know, a couple weeks ago we had the baptisms. We have new life in Christ, new obedience in Christ. Now what? But for many of us who have been believers for a long time, we have that same question. What now? Now what? Right? And so last Wednesday, this past Wednesday, we started a new uh, study. Uh, this Sunday we talked about the accountability of our faith and what we will be held accountable for as a believer, as a non-believer, with the, tr the truth of Jesus Christ. And here, I, I think it's a very essential part of being a believer, and it's where Jesus is teaching about prayer and fasting. Verse 6 says, But when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your Father in private. Then your Father, who sees everything, will reward you. 
in these two verses before we even really get into the breakdown of the prayer or how he's teaching us. It's about the spirit of prayer. I used this quote this Wednesday. I'll repeat it again. The great theologian, Charles Spurgeon, tells us, the act of prayer is blessed. We pray once. We ask Christ to live in our hearts. It's definitely a blessing. The habit of prayer is even more blessed. When we become where it's not just a thing to do, but the thing to do, there's blessings that come within one who prays. But the spirit of prayer is the most blessed of all. And it is this that we can continue for months and years. Charles Spurgeon understood the turn of the century, 1800s to early 1900s, that it wasn't just about a prayer or a few prayers or a specific prayer or a scripted prayer, but the spirit of prayer. Well, how did Charles Spurgeon know that? Well, in two verses here, Jesus tells us through the prophet Jeremiah in the Old Testament that He wants us to call upon Him to reveal to us great and mighty things. And right here at the beginning of Matthew, he's telling us that he wants to reward us by spending time with him. So we're going to look at the Lord's Prayer here. He goes on to say, when you pray, don't babble on and on, as people of other religions do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them, for your Father knows exactly what you need even before you ask him so pray like this our father in heaven may your name be kept holy or hallowed be thy name we need to acknowledge god's name and the power that is within god's name he says may your kingdom come soon may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven we need to receive God's providence. Give us today the food we need and forgive us our sins. We need to trust in God, feel His presence, and allow Him to guide us. And as we've forgiven those who sin against us, lead us not into temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. We need to allow the rescue and through all of these portions, we are establishing the relationship. I think when the disciples would ask, Father, how do you pray? Teach us to pray. I mean, they spent three years with Him. Now, a very few of them got to see close, right? He would retreat. He would go by Himself. Some would even fall asleep. We've seen that in former weeks or, or previous weeks. But what he's trying to show us is how to establish the relationship. How important the relationship is to have with our Father in heaven. Understand the power that we have, that we can communicate with Him, that we can, we can ask Him for guidance. And if we believe, He will show us great and unsearchable mighty things. Phyllis chose blood as a theme today. This week, I've had a lot of discussion about blood. Mine's really thin right now. And my heart is very calm right now because of medicine. A lot of it. Something like AFib or something's going to try to stop me. No. I was laying in the hospital bed Sunday. And I wanted to give this message last week. And the only thing I could keep reminding myself is there's a reason, not because Jeremiah was given this word, but there is a reason why somebody is trying to stop this word from happening. And that's why I said, yep, Tim, we're going to do it this week. Prayer is important. Prayer establishes the relationship with our Heavenly Father and that relationship is what allows us to conquer demons. I shared Wednesday. I would encourage anyone that's not coming Wednesday to come Wednesdays. 
Because I talk a lot Wednesdays like I talk a lot Sundays. Terry's like, hey, man, it is a preview. But I will tell you, Sunday morning, and there's a nurse here, so she's going to see this, and she's going to be like, oh, I'm having flashbacks. But we had a gentleman who's in the hallway, and I'm hearing, I'm putting the story together, and he has grown blind in his older age. Not legally blind to where he can't see anything, not totally blind, but just his family thought it was going to be more difficult for him to get around. So they had put him in a home. And the home had called because he was being belligerent. And the hospital had him kind of strapped to his bed. And for hours, he screamed. He yelled out. He cried out in agony. I haven't done anything. Why are you having me strapped to a bed? I'm not a prisoner. You haven't even offered me something to eat or drink. Father, this is no way to live Take me home. Hours I laid in my bed in my room and I could not get up to offer help. And it was an example of the end times. Now he could be a believer. Everything to my knowledge he probably was. He called out to his father. He needed help. He needed guidance. He was doing everything that the Lord's Prayer asked him to do. He recognized where his strength and power would come from. But he found himself in a very desperate situation. And boy, no more than he would start, there was a lady that was also in the hallway, and she would get going, moaning and groaning for someone to come and help take away the pain, or, or someone just come and, and, and sit by them. And I told Carrie, I said, man, thank you for being in the room with me. Thank you for, for not leaving me. And I realized how desperate that example was of the world that we live in. For people who don't know that the God of the universe asks us to call upon Him, to call out to Him, for what? He will answer. What hope do they have? What hope do they have? Forget about understanding all of the things that He wants to show us. The world we live in right now doesn't even understand that He's there. That He wants that. That He desires us to call upon Him. Now, you may begin to question, well, the ESV unsearchable, the King James great and mighty, well, what are these unsearchable great and mighty things? I don't know, and that's the blessing. They're going to be different for each and every one of us. Based upon where we are in our life, based upon the, the circumstances that we're facing, based upon the obstacles that are going to come, He is just saying, call upon me and I will answer you. I'm being repetitive today in the word says in our prayers not to do that, but I'm being repetitive for a reason. Is our prayer life for a blessing? Or is it like Charles Spurgeon says, and it's a true spirit of how we want to live, and how we, we do live, and how we will live? Because there's a great and mighty difference within that. There's a lot of times, and uh, Carlette, we've done this in a, in a message earlier in the year where I actually sat down and I walked out and I just prayed with you in the middle of the service. Too often we say, I'll pray for you about that. Or, or, hey, if, if you're religious, will you pray? And if you're not, will you send me good vibes? Will you send me good mojo? We've heard it. I'm not even going to mock it. Because how silly does that sound? How silly does that sound? Social media this week, I saw one of the pastors and they did just that. They mocked it. Don't send your good vibrations and mojo my way. I ask you to pray. I want you to pray. We need to understand how important prayer is in our Christian walk. 
We need to understand how important prayer is in our maturation of our faith. We need to understand that even all the benefits that we'll gain through our prayer life, that it is the essential way we build and establish the relationship with Jesus Christ. In verse 14, it tells us, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. New believer, now what? We've got to learn how to pray. We've got to learn how to call upon our Father, and we need to learn how to forgive. I had a good conversation with my brother-in-law yes, uh, Friday. And he was talking about a specific co-worker. He says, I love Mondays. I love Mondays because when she comes and she asks questions, I can help bridge the gap and mend the pieces for her because she didn't understand everything from the pastor. And not that I do, but I love that she's confident and she can come to me and she can ask. I was like, absolutely. How many of us look forward to Mondays to share what the pastor brings you in church on Sunday? Not me. Not me. What God shows you. What God's showing you through your prayer life. What He's, what he's setting up and guiding you for the next day and for the week to come about coworkers and the needs that they're going to need met. Do we look forward to that? Because I'm telling you, just like the people in the hospital, they're secretly crying out, and they want to know. They need to know that somebody loves them. Somebody loves them. And in this conversation, he said last week, she said, you know, I've done a lot of great things. I'm not a bad person. I've prayed to God to show me these things and these things and these things, and I'm just not getting it yet. And he says, all I can tell you is keep doing it. Keep doing it. And I said, man, you want to come and preach my message? That's what we're talking about. That's what Spurgeon was talking about. Keep at it. Where is our confidence when we pray once, we don't get an answer, so we're done? Where is our confidence in the, in the great Almighty Father when we pray for a few days and we don't get an answer and we're done? But soon when we create a spirit within us of prayer, the requests change. The requests change from healing to understanding. The request changes from a miracle to how do I live with this? I told you Sunday, I had some AFib issues. We don't know why. I had a doctor Friday tell me, she goes, I think, I think you'll probably be A-OK. -okay. No issues. I think you'll be OK. Maybe I will. But she also told me this. Maybe God's trying to teach you something. When we walk through life with an understanding that God is in control. I go to work on Wednesday. I'm feeling okay. I'm going to preach Sunday because prayer is important. But when we have a, a, a doubt of who's in control, when we don't understand who is calling the shots? Who is guiding our life? Well, now it becomes way worse. Now it becomes questions like, well, should I do this? Should I do that? Should I make these changes? What about these changes? Oh my goodness, I don't know if I can do this. That's really tough. Well, what if I do this a little bit? God, 
Can you just handle it? I'm going to call upon you, God, and I'm just going to say, handle it. That's been my prayer this week. And actually, before preaching it, I got to dwell on it another week. And it's this same message. Just let me handle it. Just let me handle it. Now, I can't tell you, nor would I want to tell you, hey, it was caused by this specific reason. We think we know why in my life. But how many instances in every, each and every one of our lives do something come up where we say, I don't know why, but I think this, I think that, and we bypass the important part to just say, God, handle it. God, handle it. Now, I'm going to be smart, and I'm also going to have a heart-healthy diet. If my niece was here, she would have just went, ah. She did it. She did this week. She was like, oh, Jeremiah has issues, and we change a diet. But I will tell you, I think what God's telling us this Sunday, He seeks a lifestyle change. Forget the diet. Forget the exercise. He's tired of us exercising. He's ready for us to get in. Do the work of prayer. Do the work of forgiving and execute what He's asking us to do. Let's not just get a blessing in a prayer. Let's not get a blessing in a few prayers. But let's really create within us a spirit of prayer to call upon Him and to ask. To seek out everything. Because I think when we do, we're going to see the, the pews fill up. But more importantly, we're going to see hearts changed. That's what I care about. Changed hearts. Changed hearts. Now, I don't want to skip the fact that Christ is teaching us about prayer and fasting through the book of Matthew, through His prophet, and so fasting is part of it. And in verse 16, He says, And when you fast, don't make it obvious, as the hypocrites do, for they try to look miserable and to shelved so people will admire them for their fasting. I tell you the truth, that is the only reward they will ever get. But when you fast, comb your hair, wash your face. No one will notice that you are fasting except your Father, who knows what you do in private, and your Father, who sees everything, will reward you. Now, there's some people who medically can't fast in the tense of fasting, not eating. But aside from that, what I saw from this a second week study in was, you know what? I can walk around every day from now on and say, yeah, I had AFib. I've got AFib. I live with AFib. I do this with AFib. This happened with AFib. And everyone would be like, good for you. Right? I'm tired of hearing it. I'm tired of hearing it. Or I can say, you know what? Regardless of what this life throws at me, I'm going to wake up. I'm going to wash my face. I'm not going to comb my hair. And I'm going to conquer the day because God's walking in front of me. I'm not going to do things I do for spite or for show like the hypocrites, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious people. When I forgive, I want my neighbor to know it's genuine forgiveness. When someone comes up to me and they're living a lifestyle very different from mine that I don't understand and they may not understand mine, they're going to see true love in the sense of you're more than welcome. You got questions? I'll try to help you through that. I have questions too. And sometimes got to keep praying. Keep praying. He'll show you. He'll reveal it. But for now, and let me love and forgive you through the process. Let's walk through it together and learn together. It opens the doors for a lot of different conversations. The world we live in wants to divide us so 
much. Competition in the workplace. Laws passed, not passed, overturned, returned, reworked, given here, given there. I'm glad I don't have to deal with that. But I have a responsibility. And I will be held accountable for it. I got to call out to God. And I got to believe he's going to answer me. And he's going to lead me. And he's going to show me the things that I can't even fathom at this point. And when he does, I'm going to be enriched. I'm going to be able to walk away and say I've got a relationship. I'm going to allow him to work in my life. We're going to keep going through different things on what now I told you a few months ago I bought a different Bible the apologetics the how to how to defend our faith but before we can defend our faith we have to understand our faith we have to understand our faith Wednesday night we spoke and showed several examples that when we become a believer in Christ. He blots out. He throws it as far as the east is to the west. And he remembers our sin no more. That's something Jeremiah can't do. Sometimes. But God can. Our Heavenly Father is a merciful God. And He loves us. And at the very, very foundational sense, He wants us to understand that He died for us for a purpose. He died for us to wash away our sins and remember them no more. But He desires us to call upon Him. I'm going to do something different in the close of this service. Tim, I think you've probably got a song, a praise and worship song that's just real quiet and low, one of the ones that you play in the morning. He's shaking his head. He said, you didn't warn me for this. I want to close this morning with several minutes of just quiet, tranquil time for prayer. In your pew, at the altar, all be forward. If more people have other things, we can have other people walk forward. But today I have the pressure that there are things we need to let go. There are things that we need to forgive and we need to handle it today. Because when we walk out of here, we're going to feel renewed. We're going to feel refreshed. And we're going to honor God in doing that. So in the next few moments, we don't have the fancy lights. There's not going to be any smoke, right? But seriously, spend a few time asking Him, calling upon Him. And in a few moments, I'll turn the microphone back on and I'll finish and wrap it up. But truly, truly, ask Him, what now? What now? He may not answer you. We're going to start that spirit of prayer today.
I told Carrie yesterday when she was pushing me in Frontier City, there's a humility and a humbleness that comes with just setting still. I'd never been pushed in a wheelchair. We got the faces. We got the looks. You look able-bodied. Why are you in that? But there was a humility that came with just setting. We don't like to calm down, to slow down. It's not in our nature. It's not in our society. The most powerful thing about prayer is slowing down, asking, really allowing His name to be the force that guides our next decision our next steps and being able to express that humility to our father who knows we're not keeping anything from him and I can tell you this week there was the joke where my wife was like do you know how much I love you yes I do but in the same example of her demonstration of pushing me and me sitting there and just being humble. Christ loves you. And He wants you to just sit and know that He loves you. Through the hard times, through the great times, through the blessings, and for the decision making to come. He loves you. He honors you in those ways when we're able to do that. Church, I challenge you today, and I know it's Mother's Day, and I know it's a little bit different. Yes, reach out to your mothers if you still have them. Share your appreciation for them. Even, I've heard this before, even if they were an awful mother, they have shaped you to be different, right? Sometimes. Sometimes we don't get to pick what life throws at us. But by forgiving, if that's your Mother's Day example, God will bless you. Your Father will bless you. And if you have a great relationship and you can go and show that appreciation, He's going to reward you for that because you're honoring your mother and your father which is His commandment. And if they're not here today, and they're in heaven and they've gone before, spend time. Thank your Father for that time. And I truly believe there's a spiritual connection that exists that they'll know about that as well. But whatever you do, pray. And keep praying. And keep praying. Go with me in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, we just thank you for showing us today in your word that your name is powerful. That there's a way that we should pray and there's reasons to pray and to always be in prayer. Lord, to trust on you. To feel your presence. To trust your guidance. To allow you to deliver us and to rescue us from whatever is on us. But Lord, all the while, by establishing the relationship with You. Whatever example it may be this week, let us be excited for this afternoon, for tomorrow, to go to our neighbors, our co-workers, our friends. And if it's through humility with forgiveness, if it's through love to understand, allow us to reach them, to let them know that you love them. You love us. You love us all, and you died for us. Or continue to shape us, mold us into the men and women that you would have us to be. Lord, allow us to be your hands and your feet while we still have breath in our lungs and a beat of our heart. So, Father God, thank you this day for blessing us with mothers who have loved and nurtured us. Lord, thank you for teaching us about humility and humbleness. 
to just seek your face. Lord, help us as we depart from this place. Lord, help us enter in the mission field strong and boldly, taking your word and the gospel to everyone we meet. And all these things we ask in your heavenly gracious name. Amen.